Hey, John. Hey, Tim. How are you? Very good, mate. How are you? Mate, beautiful up here. Lovely sunny day in uh, sunny Queensland. So, yeah, very good. Thank you. Very good. Happy luck. Have you been busy? Mate, it's been pretty hectic up here. We've um, obviously, we're a bit of a different parallel universe, I think, what's happening in Melbourne. But, uh, yeah, the, the market up here has definitely been, I think, firing since Home Builder. It's yeah. Been yeah, it's been a been pretty good time. Yeah, very good. Listen, there's a, there's a few people uh, flooding in now, but we might give them a couple of minutes to build up. Um, g'day, Sally. G'day, Jan. Hey, guys. Sorry. Paul Adams, good to see you, mate. Uh, Josh, yeah, we've got a few coming in. Um, I suppose before we get into it, John, um, I, I know there's going to be a lot of Victorians that are uh, going to be on this call, and I think the number one question everyone's going to be uh, asking is, um, what's it actually like to visit a restaurant or go into a bar and have a pot of beer? I know it is. It is. Um, it, I really do feel for all my Victorian friends down there at the moment because, yeah, up here, like it's you know, I think I don't think we're complacent. I don't think we're um, we're. I think we're still, you know, we know that this is not, we're not immune to it, but it's, we definitely feel very lucky. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to, um, I think we, we've got some form of normality, but we also don't. Like, I think we know that, you know, we're still going to be cautious and things like that, but it is, yeah, I, I, I do feel for all my Victorian friends. I, I really do hope you guys are doing all right down there. Yeah, it's a, it's a distant memory for us uh, at the moment. We've um, been a long time between, between drinks for a lot of us. <laughs> well, look, I, I think, yeah, it's, it's hopefully the summer can come around quicker and, you know, hopefully it starts to, to slow down there for you guys. So, oh, mate, we just want the borders to open so we can uh, get up there and see some of your beautiful sunshine. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we, we're, we're going to welcome you. I think, we, I think a lot of people up here also, we, look, we're missing that trade, you know, so I think it needs to um, look. But at the same side, you know, Tim, it's funny, uh, and I can see you've got a, obviously a few people coming in now, hopefully won't steal too much, but... You know, we've in, in some of the developers and who we're speaking to, we actually are still seeing a lot of people from Melbourne. They've been actually like a very big buyer yeah. for, for, our, for our product up here. So it's, uh, I think there might be some people going, you know what, it's now that time decision to move. Yeah. Or to, you know, if they're not anchored and down. You, um, you, uh, you picked it on the last webinar we did with, um, with Chris, uh, Chris Loffy. You said uh, every time, I think the last topic was actually effects on real estate in, in COVID. And yeah. you're actually talking about what happened back in 2008 with the GFC. And how every time there is that, um, any sort of recession or anything like that, you start to see a big migration happening from the southern states. So you got yeah, to exactly. And look, I think the, you know, the, the head of REIQ, up here came out yesterday and said that yes this this trend this interstate trend that we're going to be seeing i i think it's a reality i think people like if you if you you know like i've got friends in melbourne who who I was talking to with and they said that you know we've moved down to melbourne because melbourne's a fantastic city like it is the cultural city of australia you know you're there for the nightlife you're there but if that's taken away you know what's why you're there now and i think that, that could be something if you're not anchored there maybe you know it's time to go and life goes on with COVID. We said this before, so I think now's a good time for people to think about things. They've got the time to do it, and yeah. you know, away we go. Well, as you know, uh, John, we've, we've uh, focused a lot of attention on regional areas in the past year, Geelongs, your Ballarats, and Sunny yeah. Coast, and you know, obviously a bit with, uh, in Brisbane with yourselves. But I think what COVID's really taught us and people working from home now, that those, those regional areas you know, uh, are going to see a really big uplift in not in pro just property prices, but migration from the major cities. Cause yeah. You know, not everybody's going to be heading back to an office. They, they can go and live near the beach and, um, you know, still operate like we are today. No, you guys, and that's true. Like, you know, like we've seen people that are probably were renting in the inner city, maybe in like working in the, in the, in the retail or, or hospitality, um, you know, potentially having to move back home to these regional centres. Mm -hmm. um, you're right, like job growth. Uh, space, less density, yeah. uh, a lot of the figures that I think you've been seeing as well, like are showing that these markets have actually sustained themselves pretty well. So yeah. on price, I think, you, you know, you're probably right there. Yeah. Yeah. All right, looks like we've, we've got the numbers up now. Um, we might start kicking things off. So I do have to use the second screen down here to see where um, see uh, the questions. But look, first of all, uh, welcome uh, everybody who's joining us today for the, the webinar topic, House and Land Packages 101. Um, today's topic, obviously, one of the reasons, and which you touched on before, John, one of the reasons we're having this uh, discussion is because the federal um, home builder grant, $680 million, has had, um, seen a flood of people rushing to house and land uh, developers. And 
you know, uh, I know you've been in, in real estate for a lot longer than me, John, 18 years experience with um, the likes of a lot of um, uh, advisory groups, Colliers, CBRE, Urbis, to name a few. So I, um, I thought who better to get on a call and talk about maybe not just the pros um, to buying a house and land. We all know that you can save a lot of money in stamp duty, you get you know, warranties and all those beautiful things that come with a, a new property. But there are also some uh, pitfalls that people need to be aware of as well. So um, I suppose uh, your, your background at the moment, John, not just in advisory, but now working for um, Urbane Homes as research and strategy. Um, you guys are a little bit different to a traditional builder. And I thought um, bringing you guys on to talk, talk to me a little bit about um, how you guys operate as a, a fully integrated house and land solution, more so than just a traditional builder. Um, and I know from our discussion only a week ago, looking at uh, some of the tricks that some house and land builders are using online, I think it's really a good time for people to be aware of what's going on out there and you know, some things that they maybe should be looking to avoid. Um, I know Victoria alone had about 15,000 applications for the, the home builder uh, grant. And I know that there's some regulations around timeframes and all that sort of thing. But, you know, when people are looking to um, choose a builder, there's some things that they should be looking at because a, a full turnkey and a fixed price package doesn't always mean exactly that. No, that's right. And look, it's, it's, it's unfortunate because, you know, the industry, it's, it's, it's got some smoke and mirrors. And I think, you know, a lot of people, it's, it's not like they do this every day, you know, like you might only do this for the first time and only time in your life where you might build brand new. And for first home buyers, obviously, you know, you're kind of funneled with the grants and the incentives to buy new. So it is really uh, a cloudy field that I think a lot of people, I, I'd love to educate them on. So thank yeah. you so much for having me, Tim and Reventon. So yeah, it's good that I can do that for you. That's all right. Well, look, um, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. I know you've got some um, slides to take us through. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the share screen and away we can go. So, guys, yeah, th thanks, everybody, for, for turning up today and I and, uh, really appreciate everybody's time. Um, I'm just going to um, just pull up this slide so hopefully everybody can Actually see. getting that ready as well, John. I was just going to say to the, uh, the audience, we can see um, there's plenty in there now. Just um, as the, the topic goes on or as the presentation goes on, feel free to jot in any questions that you might have. We will have a QA and a at the end. Um, and uh, depending on how many questions we have and how much time we've got, if we don't get to everybody, my team will certainly get back to you um, following the, the webinar. So make sure you keep your questions coming. Yeah, definitely. And, and look, there's no such thing as a silly question, guys. So definitely throw it in. Look, I've, um, this is a really brief one. And as Tim sort of mentioned, it's probably not going to go much about some of the, you know, the, the basics of like why off the plan and things like that. I probably want to go into a little bit more of the dark area of, of this and where I think a lot of builders, um, you know, and, and, and when we say builders, I mean, I'm, I'm talking what I call like stadium builders, you know, like big name builders are, 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 are play at this. It is, it is not nice how the industry sort of does it. And it's not definitely great for the experience of a first homeowner and even to an investor. So look, um, the key thing for us is really, you know, what is exactly turnkey mean? You know, what is the, what is the um, you know, the hidden information and disclaimers? What is exactly does fixed price mean? And, you know, even looking at a floor plan, like what am I actually getting from when I'm looking at a marketing document versus what I'm gonna be getting on my build and looking at the schedule of finishes. So hopefully I can answer really quickly some of the things that I want you, you know, if your audience today, Tim, to, to ask questions of any builder, you know, to when you're going through the exercise is, is what I, what am I actually paying for? Because this is, this is to me is probably one of the most scariest things is, is you don't, you know, they say you're a fixed price, you're a turnkey, which the definition of that is supposed to be that a turnkey, I'm able to move in, I've got everything needed, nothing else required. And that I'm fixed price being that, you know, if I'm paying a hundred dollars for that item, that it's not going to have any strings attached and end up costing me $150. So this, this is a, a systematic problem in the building side. And the, the whole journey of buying a house is meant to be you know, a bit of a dream and it's meant to be a, a really enjoyable experience. But I've seen so many dreams turn into nightmares over, overnight by entering into the wrong contracts with the wrong builders. Absolutely, absolutely. And look, we've, we've, uh, this is a bit of a journey that we actually find a lot of people with, our, with the, the local sales team here at Urbane, you know, where they go through that journey and unfortunately they waste a lot of time getting to the point where they get to a price and then finding out that then the price has changed when they start. So we get a few people that do full circle and come back. And I guess that they put some pretty big promises here, which, you know, that's really there to, to give teeth to what we're saying. So 
you know, from, if, the, if, the, if your audience have got more information on that, Tim, pretty, please obviously explain it to them or, you know, yeah. in detail as to what those promises are. Um, so look, obviously the key things that, you know, I, I think before I get into some of the tricks of the trade is, is, you know, this is something that I think we've got to get into the detail of, which is where the, some of the hidden costs are. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is just in the inexperience of, of, of building. Like, you know, I don't think many people, like I, don't, I couldn't imagine too many first homeowners knowing what the issues are with soil. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to know, like, and this is a, this is the reason why I jump on this straight away is Urbane's a little bit different because we're, we're sort of taking all the hard work by packaging up and having the, the land and the build married together. So you're not, you're not having to worry about it, but some people might buy the land first and then look for a builder to put on that. And that, that marriage is never, it's never wedded. It's sometimes a little bit difficult. So this is where costs now can blow out for the build because you know, you, you, what do you know about the soil conditions of your land? And if you bought it off the plan, that land, you can't test, the builder can't test on that until they obviously get on site. So you'll see a lot of conditions about site costs or wording about site costs. And a lot of that's got to do. And the other one is the big, the big one that you've got to look for is allowances. Absolutely. That, that, that's it, Tim, you've, you've nailed it, is, is always that word of allowance, which gives you a, a buffer, I guess you could say, or yeah. a budget that generally is never, it's, it's always exhausted. So, um, and, and always to, um, you know, the benefit of the, of the builder as well, you know, they're, um, they're putting an allowance in there to protect them, not you. Correct. And so, you know, again, what do you know about soil types, things like this? And this is where a lot of builders can really prey on this because, you know, they might have really, uh, uh, I guess, a very high benchmark of a soil quality that will probably never be reached on their contract prices as, as their buffer. And then you're probably going to be hitting a lot lower, which means an additional cost. And, and I've seen some pretty, it, it doesn't seem to be like a, an exact playing field of what you're paying for. So this is definitely something where, you know, again, I would always stress about, you know, is this included as a fixed price? Like I'm not going to be charged extra no matter what. Now, again, very difficult for some builders to do. We obviously make that a promise. In following that, your slab is the next best thing, right? Like it's the next most important thing to your home because you go, the soil sits on the slab and you need to put the right slab for the soil. So this is where a lot of costs come in. So you might have a fixed price contract or a turnkey trunk contract that says, you know, side allowances and things like this. But if they hit a bad soil type, you know, you might see, you can see your cost blow out yeah. because you don't want, you know, no builder or hopefully no builder wants to have your, your land come down and your driveway stay up here. So you're going to, you know, you don't want to do this. You want to be, you don't want to be on a current affair. So obviously yeah. that's, that's part of the cost. Um, and it's, then, a, it's interesting you, you say that, John, an example I had, uh, that can be even not in, in necessarily in the way of just what's in the soil, but also, you know, the fall on the block as well. You know, I had a, I had a client last week who, um, who came back to me to question a price, like they found another estate or another block, same size, same suburb. And they came back to me and said, well, look, it's $30,000 difference. And, um, you know, knowing that uh, the other estate, I said, there's a reason I'm not selling in that estate. Uh, and it's because you can, you've got eight metres worth of fall on that. And I said, that's going to have a huge effect on not only even, and their, their contract price for the build wasn't um, fixed price for that reason, because the builders got a huge amount of cost in um, either fill or cut. And um, these are things that people aren't taking into account when they're actually looking at even just the price of the land that they're purchasing, because they might save 20, 30,000 there, but what it can uh, cost them, even in uh, aesthetically, what their place is going to look like at the end when you've got you know, multiple, level, um, multiple levels on the, on the house and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Tim. Like no, no site is created equal. So, and, and you're right, like land pricing, there's generally I have a saying, the cheaper the land, the something is wrong with the land. Yeah. So if you see something that is a bit of anomaly in like your area, like say, you, you know, the average, the average land price is 200,000 for say like a 400 square meter, but then you see a 600 square meter lot, that's like 150,000. Generally that's something is wrong with that lot. And you do see these in projects, like most projects have the very big shape, odd shaped lot. That's generally like the same price as another one. Yeah. Uh, and it's because something's wrong with it, but you, you hit it on the head, you know, like, fall adds costs yeah. because you've got to either do more retaining yeah. and at a certain, you know, depending on your council and your requirements, you know, that retaining, uh, again, also the, the, the quality of the development as well could be cheaper or more expensive. 
for Urbane, we always want to have everything done the right way. So flat land, properly retained, you know, proper um, proper retaining over certain height levels as well with with concrete retaining and aluminium. You know, the the, the, the the direction of water flow as well is very important. Obviously, a slab and water is very important, guys. So this is why having flat land and actually being able to direct it with retaining and things like that is, is absolutely protective for your slab. Yeah. Um, and then Tim, other things that, you know, that come into this hidden site thing as well from pricing is, you know, the frontage and depth of a home. You never want, you, you know, sometimes you see these big frontages, but very shallow depth. Yeah. Uh, so you end up with rectangular. That's actually not, that's what I would call inferior. Yeah. But having maybe a smaller frontage and a longer depth, that's probably more desired. So a square home is never great versus a rectangular home. You know, you want these things and that, that does add to price and, and also difference in, in values. But again, flat blocks, you know, properly retained, um, you know, trees and vegetation and rock are probably the next big cost as well. So, you know, if you look at, ultimately guys, you want to be able to work with someone who's looked after all this, you know, like you don't really, you're not the expert, but you need to be able to factor all this in. And guys, it's a question you need to ask your builder. Have you factored, you know, the ability for if you hit, say, boulders under the ground. Now, as I said, a lot of builders won't know this, but if you're working with some that really know the estates or the communities, they will have a fair idea of what's under the ground. So you want to make sure that this is included or an understanding of like what it could cost you. And, and John, look, I know you'll probably touch on this soon, but um, you know, for a lot of our viewers there, you know, um, the way that you purchase um, land a lot of the time, um, or if we take a step back and think about what the land developer is actually doing to land before it's available for you to build on, they're, they're packaging up, let's say there's 100 lots, you know, they're, they're, they're selling 100 lots to individual purchasers with yep. individual builders. So you might have metric on one, Glendale on another, Simmons on another, but each one of them is going to do something different to the land. And I suppose where Urbane comes, uh, comes in differently, because you're controlling the land and the build, you guys are cutting into the, you know, you're taking 80 lots in one go, cutting into the land and doing all the hard work first, which most land developers won't do. And the reason you're yep. doing that is because you're end to end. And that comes out in the savings as well. And we'll see that later in, in your presentation when we look at some of your developments. The, the price that you can put the product out to the market is far superior because you're doing all of that extra work first because you're going to control the build as well. Yeah, exactly. Like we, we look for the civil contractor on site who's preparing the land to take a lot of that hard work out of the builder. So if, for example, as I said, like, you know, previously, like if we've got vegetation or we've got retaining or we've got a certain amount of fill or soil, we're doing all that at the start with that big civil contraction movement versus like getting the individual block owner, you know, and, and that also saves us again, if we hit, you know, like we said, with the different types of soil conditions, or if we hit like in this one, which is, you know, like uh, this is one that a lot of people, uh, you know, and even uh, it's funny, I'll call a builder or a developer and be like, you know, what's this land? And they'll say, oh, we've got some bushfire and acoustic, but they can't actually tell you how much the cost is of that. So, you know, bushfire and acoustic, particularly if you're out more greenfield, which is sort of more frontiering land, you're going to have this cost associated with it. Infill, not so much. So infill's like, you know, where you've got an existing residential around you. Um, but bushfire can add, you know, from a couple of grand all the way up to 10, maybe a hundred grand if you're in a blaze zone. So um, it's legislation. You can't, you know, you've got to be certified. You can't be putting a home, um, you know, without the right materials that can, that can protect itself against like that bushfire or acoustic. Okay. So you can't get around it. Um, no builder. Um, you just won't be able to live in the home if it's not certified correctly. Um, but guys, like this is probably where I think, so all that, you know, like that's probably like a little bit of detail around just the land component. Now I probably want to sort of talk more about I guess what I would call the shark component yeah. and, and where this is where everybody's getting trapped at the moment. I've seen so much of this at the moment. And, you know, um, I think something that's difficult for, um, you know, agents like ourselves, we will, we'll go out and we'll provide somebody with a full turnkey and fixed price. And that's a true product. Like it is, it is uh, got everything. And it literally means that by the time we settle on that property, your tenants are moving in or you're moving in. Now, the way that these people are advertising at the moment, it's very, very misleading. And it means that when we're taking a package to somebody, you know, the price that I'm showing them, it can't compare with what's happening on realestate.com because it's lead gen. They're, they're literally, it's clickbait. And, you know, people can't really trust 
uh, in a lot of cases, can't trust that um, price that's on there because they're discounting, um, you know, um, whether it's a first home buyer's grant or whatever it may be, and the person who's coming in to purchase that might not even be entitled to that grant. It's so frustrating. It is so frustrating. And it's frustrating because I think once you take your, your you know, your client on the journey with that, they, they understand it and they also feel frustrated themselves because they've gone through wasting their time on it. Um, it's, look, it's, it's one that, you know, I've just pulled out this scenario here and it, you're right, like this really doesn't happen in the apartment side of, of, yeah. of property because it's very fixed, but in house and land, it, it's, it's like it's unregulated. Yeah, how bad some of the commentary is. Um, so look, guys, if I'm on realestate.com and I'm looking at a house and land package, these I'm probably going to highlight just some of the language and probably some of the uh, pitfalls or things that would probably pull some red flags out for me. Um, and, you know, and, and, and this is something that I would be questioning. So guys, like this is obviously a package up here in, in, in Southeast Queensland in Springfield. Um, it looks like an ordinary package that you would see it advert, advertised. It looks pretty good. You know, you can see here the price of 476, 500, including FHOG. This is a very common thing that I'm, I've been seeing across the country, actually, not just up here in Southeast Queensland. But basically what that's saying is that that 476500 is including the first homeowner's grant. So basically in Queensland, you need to add 15000 to that price because it's saying that if, if I, I'm only getting that price if I'm a first home buyer. Mm -hmm. So that's one scenario. So that's actually not, that's a bit misleading, I still think. The other thing too is you can see here clearly it says Colleen is the project, the Stockland project, really nice project up here in Springfield. Um, you can see they say turnkey house and land. So automatically, remember that saying of what turnkey means to us means that I walk in with keys, I don't need anything, I'm ready to live. Okay, that's the true definition of it. Now, um, any real estate.com ad generally has a terms and conditions that's been provided by the, the, the seller. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you can see here this home, um, the terms and conditions of this packet is this home has not been constructed. Okay, so we know it's off the plan and is subject to land availability. Now, this is again a, a tricky one because a lot of builders, what I call ghost packaging, meaning that they don't actually have the land secured. That, so block, that block's probably sold. It could be sold. It, it, it might not even be the block they're advertising. Yeah. So, you know, it might be a different block. It might be just a clickbait block that's a price pointed block and then they might put you on a more expensive one. You don't know. So they don't have the availability. So when you ring and you go, can I have that block? It might not be there. Uh, they, this is a trick that a lot of people do. They'll put their cheapest block in. It's not real, it's not there. And then you move to another block saying, oh no, we sold that one, Tim. You missed out, mate, um, but I got another one. You know, so um, the house price here is subject to site specific soil test, contours, and final site investigation with head office approval. So that's basically saying we have no clue what the land is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so remember everything we talked about at the start about the soils and everything like that, they don't know. So that price again, we know certainly isn't turnkey, okay? Um, then you can see facade upgrades will incur additional costs. So uh, every builder can have a different definition of what a facade, so the facade is the lipstick or the, the makeup that you would put on the house. Yeah. Um, and generally the more makeup, the more expensive. And, you know, certain builders have different grades of that and different sort of finishes. Um, you can also see that there is no bushfire or acoustic protection. So again, generally in areas of greenfield, you're gonna have this. So that can range from three grand for some acoustic or three grand for bushfire, it just depends or more. So yeah. automatically we're just, you can see here how we're just racking up dollars yeah. onto this package. And then finally, this is probably the funny, like you can see here, obviously should any changes occur to the first homeowners grant and you know, basically the photos and illustrations. So I don't really know what I'm getting here. Yeah. But it's not about what you're getting, it's about making that call. Now, just if I go into the detail, we know this is BS or automatically, now, and Tim, you mentioned it before, that dirty word of allowances right there. Um, to fence and landscape a whole yard, which is a 400 square meter lot for five grand, okay? Don't know. 
if that's achievable with that budget. One thing that's worthwhile mentioning on that as well, John, where I've seen a lot of um, a lot of uh, purchasers have gone and done this on their own, and they haven't had good conveyances. And, they, and, and a conveyancer obviously looks at you know the the land transfers, but they don't look at a, a build contract. Typically, they, they don't review it at all. And if you don't have experience in reading that and, and knowing what obligations you've got with the, the estate itself, we've found that people have um, lost money because they haven't completed nature strips on time, they've been fined. Um, sometimes the, the uh, developer or the uh, estate will have grants like $2,000 to go towards your um, landscaping and things because they want to make sure that the streetscape is kept in a certain um, you know, um, aesthetic uh, order. And there's, there's I've been a lot of people in the past that have uh, lost money that way because they've been fine because they haven't met the regulations of the estate. Exactly. And can I just say that nothing, nothing is free with a builder. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, nothing is nothing that is given like these big, these big statements of like, you know, with $2,000, you can get $30,000 worth of value. Yeah. All this is not, this is not how it works. Now um, there's actually lots of things that there's lots of tricks to this, which they can do. Like, you know, like they might put in this feature here of like, say, a big 900 stainless steel oven, for example, but you miss out on other things. So it's putting the bells and the whistles that we know that sound really good to you now. But see, no, there's nothing sexy about, you know, site works yeah. and soil allowance. So you can see any re retaining is excluded. So like this is, this is how we can make the cost up for giving you certain things, like either a certain ceiling height or a certain type of oven, but the, the the actual cost of that versus what you've then got to pay extra is almost sometimes triple. Well, it's so got like, to come from somewhere, doesn't it? It, it, it? There's nothing free. Hmm. It's always worked out. So guys, like this is a really big trick um, that a lot of the guys, that a lot of guys look. Look, I went through this. I jumped on. I'm not going to name the builder. Obviously, I'm not not going to throw rocks at anybody. But you know, like it, this is more a caution that you can easily see from anybody when you're looking at it. Look, I, you know, in looking at this, I can automatically see that there was no side costs. Obviously, the facade's not included. It, it didn't have any bushfire, no acoustic, and that's where the price could increase. Now, just going a little bit deeper, you can see here, guys, like I went to the builders, like inclusions range, you know, for what they were saying. They made some very big statements at the front, but then when you go to the actual inclusions of, the, of that home, they were very different. So what they were saying as a warranty on one side was different in their inclusions. This could be like just a minor error with their detail, but it doesn't fill me with confidence that, you know, they said I'm getting air conditioning on one end, but that range that I'm paying for doesn't come with an air conditioner, uh, didn't come with a dishwasher, no stone bench top. You can see the wind rating there. You know, the, 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 site, the site allowance was S-class. Now, S-class is a very good soil, um, but, you know, I know the area is probably going to be a H1, so you're going to get hit there with the, uh, with the, with the site costs. And, and this is... This is part of it, guys. Like you've got to go through the detail. Now, I do to do this, guys. What I do is sometimes I have to actually go to contract. Yeah. To, to know. So you know the, what I always tell anybody is, guys, give me a contract, and make sure it says that you are fixed price turnkey with everything that I want. Okay. Because, but I want it on a contract. Don't, yeah. don't uh, just uh, John for anybody listening now. That's the that's the first two things I'd write down. Whatever you're doing in the way of house and land package, they're the first two: fixed price and and full term key, and understand exactly what that uh, that means because they're very different from one to the next. So if there's two takeaways so far, they're it. <laughs> yeah, and th and that's it, guys. Like for me, sometimes I have to go to contract to actually work out what I'm getting, and the price that I get is just never what I start with. So. You know, there are good builders and there are builders that are practice this. It's just finding that one out. Like, it's one. Like, guys, and this is probably another one that I've seen. It's it's becoming a little bit, you know, it's interesting. Um, I looked at this one and 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 it's a it's a way that, you know, again, what do you know about the plans? And look, this this one here, the the price here, very good price for a package, four six nine nine hundred. It's a four bedroom, two bath, two car, uh, you know, with one living. Now, this, the advertised on this plan that I got was 201 square meters at the time. And this is the marketing plan here, you know? So we can see the build price is 232. They clearly say it's a fixed price, zero surprise contract, which is, which is great, you know? So that's what you want to be looking for. Um, good price, everything. You know, I was a little bit skeptical because I'm like looking at this house and generally a 201 square meter should have a two living. The bedroom sizes were a little bit funny for me as well. So 
I was just trying to understand it, you know, because I had a customer come to me with this one, and this is a great example. Um, we then looked at the we then you know we looked at the building plan, and we still couldn't really work it out because this is their building plan, 201 square meter clearly advertised here. I then gave it to the architects, my architects to review because I just couldn't see something just wasn't wasn't adding up for me. You know, getting like that size house out at that price. Yeah, it just wasn't adding up. So look, I, I went a little bit deeper with them, and what we found was this, which is you know, this extra building pad outside of the home, clearly not advertised in its marketing brochure. You know, you can't see those extra building, the concrete pads. You can definitely see it on the construction, you know, of the home in terms of the plans, which is here, yeah. here and here. And to be honest, like I didn't pick this up. Yeah. I couldn't see this. And I'm assuming most customers wouldn't look no, at it and go, they would be thinking that my area is what is under roof of 200 square meters. So John, how, how do they measure um, the, in, the, the dimensions of a house then? Look, everyone's a little bit different. It should be, it's got to be, I think, look, you know, generally it's within, within the, the uh, in, underneath the, um, roof line. The, the roof line is considered and generally sometimes that wall as well. So like, it's, it's, it's dependent on the area, or like definitely, I think every location could be a little bit different, but I think, you know, generally within that roof line. Now, if you look at that, you can see clearly where they added that extra square meterage. And this is what started to make sense that you remove that extra and it was 183 square meters. Big difference. That's a big difference because you, you know, you're thinking I'm paying for a 201 square meter home. And mm -hmm. instead, I ended up with 183 and with these concrete pads, which look, aren't usable area. Look, they're a good, they're a good feature to have, but not an expensive feature to add, you know, to pay for some concrete slab, but you know, just an additional aggregate at the side, it's not a part of your slab. So it's like, it's not that much more expensive. So for the cost of what you were getting in that, you know, this to me is very misleading, very misleading. It's probably something that, you know, I, I mean, I personally would be very, very shocked, you know, in, in getting that, knowing that I thought of what I was getting, what I am getting. So that to me is, you know, again, read the detail, but, but you can see it, hey, Tim, like looking at that plan, I, 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 it's very hard to see that, you know? Yeah, so, look, um, guys, like, so, look, a lot of builders, the, everyone changes depending on the package. And like I said, they're, they're, they're not that bad at doing it. It's just the packages are different. Some, they do change them, but just be careful when you are looking, you know, at what you are getting. It is just making sure that I'm ticking those boxes. Like, am I getting everything included, mm. you know, that I need? And look, the main ones are, for me, you know, letterbox, driveway, landscaping, definitely. Obviously, air conditioning inside, you know, that I'm fully landscaped. But the big ones for me, the big cost items are your site, your soil. You want a good foundation. Ultimately, that's it. Don't want to skimp on that. We don't want our house to move. We don't want these problems later on. Yeah. So that to me is probably the big one. Um, this is just an example of an urbane home just with a steel frame. But I don't know if everybody can see this, Tim. And I think I showed you this. This is what, what happens when you hit bad soil. Mm -hmm. You get a very big slab. Uh, and look, we, we ended up having to pay for this uh, because we hit the bad soil and we've got a promise that we are a true fixed price turnkey and that we don't change the price once we do it. If we hit that bad soil, you know, we, we end up paying for it and we ended up paying for it. So, you know, as much as we can do testing on our sites, we still hit some bad trunks of soil. So this is what it looks like. But again, it's about doing the right thing. And we communicated that with the customer and they were very happy with the result, obviously. So, yeah. So that's, that's pretty much the, the tricks of the trade that I would say, Tim. And, and uh, you know, our model is, is uh, again, you know, based on, like you said, a very, um, a very well planned approach to the project and definitely working with the land developer very closely so that we, we try to eliminate all these problems up front uh, and able to get the best price at as best as possible.
Yeah. So look, one of the one of the reasons that we um, you know started partnering up with um, you guys is, is is purely for this because we go that slide that you just had with um, you know all the ticks for Urbane and the other bills that don't. That's not a fluke. I mean, this is you know you got twenty years of experience in as in advisory as well. You've been able to identify what it is that's catching people out what consumers really need to get. And then you've, you've reverse engineered that and went, okay, we want to be able to deliver um, you know, a, um, a value-based product where there is no surprises and people know exactly what they're getting, which all three of those three uh, things shouldn't be too much to ask, but it's not, it's not seen across the board. And um, I'd like, like you, if you've got time, John, I'd love you to go through and, and talk a little bit about you know, how, how uh, Urbane works, some of the, um, you know, the guarantees that you put in place, which just aren't seen in the market at all. Yeah, so look, I'll, I'll definitely jump on that, Tim. And you're right, like, we've worked really hard at that model. It's, it's definitely by no means an easy one because you need to, I guess if you can see this integrated approach that we have, guys, you know, like that I'm showing on the screen, is that you kind of need to know the smarts of a land developer you know, we need to be as smart as a builder and we need to be able to marry those two together. So it's, it's, it's a challenge and it's not a model that works for every land developer. Yeah. And so, it, you know, it's, it's in one way that it's, it's very beneficial, but it's obviously, it, it comes with its challenges. So look, it does allow us to offer some amazing promises and we do these promises because we want to, we're trying to put, I guess, our money where our mouth is with all this stuff because it's so we, we find that this message that we're doing now is getting used a lot by others because it resonates. It, 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 it's a, it's building should be an easy process, yet it's also sometimes one of the most stressful processes in someone's life yeah. um, because there's so much money associated with it. There's so much emotion. So we put these big promises and look, we offer these promises to every one of Remington's customers, you know, and anybody that buys with us. Mm. And that is, if you find a better value package in the estates that we're in or the communities, we're not only going to match it, but we're going to give you $10,000 off. Now, that means that you know, part of my role is obviously, you know, head of research and strategy is that I'm constantly looking at value. I'm constantly researching the market. Um, Tim, you know, like you've seen me do, you know, when we're sort of working with the teams about like how detailed I go on, on the level of the competition. Yeah. And the reason I do that is, is because I don't want to pay out on that price, obviously. But yeah, I do have seen somebody who, uh, who will literally go into another builder, order a package and then say, here it is compared to mine. And, you know, I've yeah. never seen it not come out better. Uh, yeah. Before we move forward further, John, I, I probably uh, owed you a bit better um, introduction as to who Urbane is. So I was going to say, for those uh, watching, if you haven't heard about Urbane, um, you know, a bit of background on, the, they're owned by the Lynn family. So the Queensland viewers uh, that are joining us are probably familiar with that name in uh, certainly in development circles, been around for a long, long time. But for those who uh, haven't heard of Urbane Homes, do you want to give a bit of a background on how you guys are, are structured? Yeah, so the Lynn family who owns Urbane Homes, um, very, very private net wealth family up here, um, you know, has been, in, has been in residential property for, for a very long time and has focused on the residential sector. So uh, Urbane Homes is the house and land component of the family and the other component is in a uh, development funding role. So we, we work with other developers and that allows us to be able to secure um, a lot of the land packages and also, you know, apartment projects or townhouse projects that the family gets involved with. Um, for me, it's very exciting because... Um, you know, Bill, Bill, Bill and the family gave me my first role in, in property when I first started and I've kind of done full circle with, with the guys after in my career, but you know, like we, we've got a very, we've got a, a, a model that, um, you know, is, is really trying to work out a lot of the challenges in the industry that have been created over time. It's definitely not easy, but you know, the, the family is very passionate really about just value, trust and quality. And I know that's, that sounds like, uh, can roll everybody should be getting anyway, but it's yeah. um, but it, it's something that we work really hard on. And look, we we, we want to be we, we do. I, I encourage everybody, you know, to do their research, test it, because we, that's what that promise is for. But ultimately, value is at the is at the heart of this family. It is it is constantly wanting to be able to give what it's really, you know, it, it, it's it's not about making. It's it's about a legacy that they want to have. So. That, that comes with trust and ultimately quality. So, you know, it, it's something that we've been working very hard on and these promises are really there to, to, to guarantee that in a way. So um, by no means uh, do we take it lightly, um, but we feel that, you know- It's an expensive exercise for you guys if you don't. It is. So 
Look, we, we've always done, the big one really for us has always been this fixed price guarantee. Um, most, you know, HIA contracts allow you as a builder to, if you do hit any, any, any like item on the build that you are able to, to change the cost of the build. And so obviously this is one that we don't do. And we've made the audacious, you know, statement that if we change the price, I'm just going to give you the house for free. Now, that you can guarantee I'm not going to give you the house for free, right? Like, <laughs> I was about to say, I hope you change the price. <laughs> yeah, like even if it changed the dollar, you know, we're going to be doing that. So it's it's an audacious one, but one that, you know, I feel that we've had to make that statement because we're so passionate uh, about communicating these challenges that I feel like, I mean, look, I work with a lot of first home buyers uh, and it really saddens me that there's the journey that some of these people may have to go through. Uh, and that's the taintedness that this industry has, unfortunately, with people thinking that building is such a nightmare. Yeah. So, so look, yeah, the model, the, our model is, is, is very different, but uh, one that we're very happy to communicate. You know, we, we, as you said, we are end to end. So we look at the land component first and we, we work very hard on that land component because we're not looking at what I would call salt and pepper approach, approach to uh, an allocation or, a, as I said, packaging. We want to be able to, have certainty on the package that we are doing. So we look for volume or we look for control in a project that allows us to work out, you know, when we're in the land, the problems of the land yeah. um, specifically. So we might have an area of the land that's got more bushfire or more contour or different soil types. You know, we're able to work that up. So that gives us, you know, some pretty good expansion. As a consumer, um, you know, knowing the, you know, those guarantees that you've put in place there and the fact that you'll go and select, you know, you know, call it 50 lots all in one go and you're responsible for selling every one of those, as a consumer buying something through you, that gives me a lot of confidence because I know that you've already gone in and done a lot of that work because if you don't do it early, it's going to cost you later. Yeah, so it, it, outside of build or anything, just knowing that um, you've put all that work in at the front end to do the, uh, to secure that land and do that work would, would give me a lot of confidence. Yeah, and look, we're, we're also securing the land at a different price. So, you know, like that price, we're trying to pass on, like it ultimately, where we can come up with that best problem actually starts at the land. Um, you know, the build is generally a pretty fixed price on the build. It's generally going to be the land where we get that, that, that real play. So we have to work everything out to make sure that we don't have that blowout in cost, but then also that, that when we're buying in volume, we'd, you know, it's like if you could buy 100 cars, you might go get a good deal on 100 cars as one car. Right? So it's the simple scenario. But it's up to you. A lot of the costs are saved. Um, look, I keep saying this, guys. Um, it, this is a this is what we believe, and I still I, I tell every investor this is probably like I guess my third tip to anybody: who you buy from is really really important. It is you know because not only obviously the brand, but the the, the you, you're going to get a quality or a, a, I guess an experience that comes with that, and you want to buy from that because it is about working out the problems or not skimping on some of the things that can come up on a land development. So what does that mean? Like, I expect flat land. I expect proper retaining. I expect, you know, um, the, proper, uh, the proper trunk infrastructure, all these sort of things. I expect all that from my developer, you know? So you should expect that too. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, yeah. it doesn't always happen. So watch out, that's probably the big one. So the same thing applies. So who you work with, very important. They also create the community. So, you know, we, as, as, a, as, a, as a, you know, as, a, as I guess the packager or the person that's buying it or living in it, we want to have a good community. And then if they allow, who they allow as the builder is really important. So if we're not the only builder in the estate, who is the other builders? You know, this I mean, is all- We've worked with a lot of, um, um, you know, land estates where, you know, they, they literally have fines if you, um, you know, your front nature strips, um, you know, get over a certain um, height and things like that. And, you know, for, uh, for anybody, uh, whether they're an owner occupier or an investor, that's really important because, you know, how the houses in your street look, they're going to ultimately affect the value of your prices, your rentability, everything. So having, having a, you know, a well-known land developer who's got some strict rules is actually a very much a plus for you. Yeah. And covenants. Like, you know, yeah. that we've, got, we've got covenants on the, on the estate that protect us so that, you know, 
like a certain facade or landscaping that you have to have your driveway in. You know, unfortunately, it's not always applied. But again, you know, I want to, your streetscape, as I say, it's your lipstick, it's your makeup. People see that first. And what creates a community and a character yeah. need to adhere to that. Um, look, we've, we've, got a, we've got a very big background across, you know, Southeast Queensland. Um, all our homes are architecturally designed by Kevin, our architect, our in-house architect. And his role really, apart from designing every home individually, it's also about designing the community. So we, what we call streetscaping. So yeah. when we, because we've got over a hundred designs, you know, we're looking at orientation of the sun. We're looking at obviously how each lot works with, with the facades, the different floor plans, two story, single story, et cetera. And we're able to create that character of the street. So, you know, you're not going to drive into one of our communities, even though we've got the whole community or if we've got 50% of it or whatever, yeah. we're going to be a seamless approach to it. So, you know, that you need a lot of designs for that. That gives you obviously a choice as a customer. The, the only downside to what we offer though, is that we're generally fixed in the location of what we're doing. So, yeah. you know, we're not, look, because this is a part of the saving. Biggest, biggest, biggest money maker for a lot of builders is variations. Yeah. Soon as you do a variation, it's not, you're not paying a retail price for that variation. You're paying an exorbitant amount of cost. So this is where they know. And a lot of the packages are actually set up to create a variation need. So it's, it's, it's an extra added cost. So look, this is an idea of like a 3D model that we work on projects where we're looking at the contours of the site, you know, and then we're, we're working towards like, you know, the facades and then obviously we're moving internal. But as I said, we have a boxed optional upgrade that we want to do. They're very select. We don't like to do design changes because that adds costs. It's just not our model. So that's the well, downside. I think, I think with a hundred different um, uh, design layouts, you've probably got enough there. Yeah, and look, you know, we've got a couple of optional, we've like, got enough optional upgrades that we feel like we think are the main ones. And, you know, they can vary in price of like, if you want timber floor and things like that. If I'm an investor though, I've got, we've got what we feel, what we offer as a standard. Yeah. Is not for the investor, it's actually for the owner occupier. Yeah. And that is who we're targeting. That's we right. And, and for any right. of the investors that are watching that, uh, watching at the moment as well, you know, I, I find that a lot of investors can be really, you know, price focused and they can be looking at, you know, I can get that one, uh, this build at uh, this builder 20 grand cheaper. But the thing is, you've got to look at those inclusions and you've got to think about who's buying the property from you the next time, because you're not making money um, uh, now, you're making money on the person who's coming in to purchase it off you in years to come. So thinking about, you know, um, the upgrades like higher ceilings and, and um, you know, the colour schemes being neutral, you know, you don't want to be walking into a place and you go, wow, that place was definitely bought in, in 220 because it's got green bathrooms like the, like the 70s. It's really important that they're, they're thinking about these items. So, that's so right, Tim. Like I've seen it where like something's very trendy now and then literally a year away, it just, it just it's gone. So, you know, like we, we've tried to keep, look, we upgrade our design packages, you know, every 18 months. We try to keep it obviously very trendy uh, and what's in season, but very neutral and classic. And that's to, what, to, that to us is obviously about longevity. Mm -hmm. Look, as we said, we are not the builder. Um, and, and, and hence why, you know, Urbane Homes doesn't really call itself a builder, but more of a packager. Yeah. Uh, and there's a reason why we removed the building element away from us. And largely it's, it's got to do with the price and the competitiveness of, of what we can offer. Um, it certainly doesn't make our life easier, yeah. um, but it has also made it um, more risk adverse because and like, and a lot of developers are doing this and they have done it probably the last decade. We've seen this where they've removed their building arm and have, have removed it completely where they now go to external components of that. So, we're doing the same where, where the margins and the, the competitiveness, you need a huge volume to do it. But then that volume, you have then more people, which means more costs associated, which means that the end user pays for all this extra body. Whereas, so for, for a bit of clarity for uh, those watching, what, what do you mean by the fact that you're not the builder? So essentially what happens is you've, you, design, you get the land, you uh, construct the land, you, uh, you actually design all the packages, but you're just getting somebody else to come in and do the construction, correct? Pretty much it. Like we, we, that doesn't mean that we walk away from it, like that, you know, over to the build, see you later. We're yeah. involved from the end end. It's just that the construction component of it, we relied on having that outsourced. Yeah. And that's so that we can remain 
you know, we're very, very concerned about the, the, the every body that you put into a business, the end user pays for this. Yeah. So your big companies that have like hundreds of staff in there, you're paying for that. And you're paying for the 30 display villages that I'm in, yeah. you know, across the country or across the state or across the area, you're paying for all this. And this all adds up. So, you know, we, we've looked at all this and we said, okay, well, you know, like I said, it doesn't make life easier because we've got to still be in front of that side of it as well. So we, we, we outsource it. We, we only work with national builder and builders. And we also tender this out regularly. So we're always looking for the most competitive rate on a build for the finish and for our design and for the quality that we need to achieve. Yeah. And so look, we've been working with Orbit Homes, Melbourne, Melbourne, Melbourne based builder. Yeah. Um, the guys that are, have been in business well over 40 years, they are um, a great relationship. One that we've just certainly just been, you know, we've just hit it out of the park with the guys and been doing it, you know, well, since 2014. But, um, you know, this, this has got some advantages. And this is probably the one of the big reasons that we did this is that, you know, Verbane is looking to produce anywhere between 200 and 300 homes a year. And obviously that can scale up and down. Um, and, and Orbit is in that same realm of doing 300 or 400, et cetera. We combine that buying power and it's like anything, if we combine that buying power, it allows me to get greater value. So first of the builder that's locally, that's still a good builder, maybe only doing a hundred or 50, you know, the guy that's buying 50 dishwashers or hundred dishwashers versus the guys that are buying 800 dishwashers, for example, yeah. you're going to get a better price. So your materials is better. Um, but as I said, it is a, it is a fine balance between your overhead and your build costs. And that's where we've been really focused on. So it's a, it's definitely a unique model, but one that look, we're very lucky that we've got some very good people that work with us. And Wayne Davis is probably one that we're very lucky to have because his background in, in building, you know, for, for Mervac and, and through AV Jennings, he's, he's now taken that and he, he leads up our operation and working with the architect and the, and the, um, uh, say Orbit, for example, to deliver on this, which you can see here, guys. Like these are some of the, these are some of the, uh, you know, the the these are from handovers.com and people that that independently, yeah. you yeah. know, like this is last year, like zero written defects and very high standard. This is actually coming from those guys. So, you know, end of the day, that's what we strive for is quality. Uh, it sounds really easy. A lot of people have tried it. You have a very hard model to put together if you don't have the, the I guess, the tools in your kit to help that end to end. So, John, the next big question is, um, you know, where, where are you selling it, man? Where have you got these projects? And um, I ask this question because uh, I'm excited about it. I love this next project that you're, um, you're about to launch. Well, yeah. what have you got coming up? So, look, I've got, I've got a project in Hillcrest that I've got. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm sort of coming into a new run of projects for the season. So, Hillcrest 88 is definitely a project that, you know, we're very excited to launch. We've, we've just done stage two, uh, sorry, stage one. Uh, it's sold in two weeks, so very quickly. Um, obviously, on the announcement of Home Builder. Um, for those that don't know where Hillcrest is, uh, it is 19 kilometres south of the CBD. Um, it's, it's an area that is, um, has been largely developed, so it's an infill location, and it's very well located uh, from, uh, I guess, amenity and infrastructure, which I'll show you in a second. The land developer is Marquee, and that's one that, you know, we're very excited to work with because we've done a lot of projects with the marquee guys. Obviously, the family is, is funding part of, you know, the community as well. So that gives some certainty that we're looking at a, at a development. They've also secured BMD as their civil contractor, which is, um, uh, for a site of this size, very important because they're a very big civil contractor, one that will do a fantastic job. Um, but, but ultimately, look at this project infill location. So you can see here, it's not greenfield, it's infill. It is broken up into three stages. We can see here to the north, some terraces. This will probably be released next year. We are focusing on this component, which is our traditional house and land side here. And the project sits, you know, Tim, and this is the most amazing bit. It's got five hectares of parkland for truly about 88 homes, but also, you know, 64 of those are house and land. So you've got this huge parkland area that's, you know, at the, and, and most of it's actually been built already. So this is the great thing. You don't get these infill sites like this 
Yeah, and I want to touch touch on on that for for those watching at the moment, especially when you're looking at house and land opportunities. It's so often that the the only place you can find these house and land opportunities are in those grain fielding, fielding areas. So that's you know the gap from where the houses uh, traditionally finish, uh, heading out of the city into the uh, the end of the urban growth boundaries. And what happens traditionally, in uh, from what my experience, what I've seen in a lot of areas like that, is that um, you might buy a block of land, build a house, and then a couple of years later, you might need to move on or sell down to go elsewhere. And the, the next pot purchaser coming in can actually buy a block of land and build their own house for a similar price um, only two years later. So it's because of that access to all the land in the same area, whereas an infill site, you don't have that opportunity. And this is why I love this project because it's very rare that you see this type of um, size infill, but also the price point that, you can, um, that you're selling it at. Exactly. And look, it's, it's one that, you know, with the great thing about infill ultimately is that you generally have very lots of uh, walkability. Yeah. You know, this is a big this is a big factor because we've got you know a little shopping center here just to the rear of the site. You know, we've got another park here, um, and there's some. You know, you look at this aerial. Um, you know, we've got this is the this is the project here. You yeah. can see that we're surrounded by an existing existing uh, community existing area, but within 12 minutes we've got a big shopping precinct. You know, and then you can see the city in the background, and then across the road here we've got this huge protected parkland. So of bushland and walking tracks. So it's it's kind of in this, it's an infill location that's just got lots going for it. Uh, from yeah, both in a lot of these greenfielding areas, you could be waiting years for that type of infrastructure. Correct. And look, this area is actually, um, you, you know, it's, it's, it's now going to start to see some, I guess, the density, mm -hmm. you know, coming through around that shopping centre. The good thing is the area that we're in is zone low, low density. So... You know, it's a good it's a good thing to have. Generally, these things generally come to a townhouse, whereas we've been able to capture it and put some housing in there. Yeah, uh, so, look, great amenity in this in this pocket um, of Hillcrest. It's in that um, southern corridor of the Brisbane CBD. So you've got you're in this sort of I guess what I would call like a trans apex, uh, which is transport apex of, of of southeast Queensland, where you're able to go anywhere you want. Yeah. You know, from 30 minutes, 22 minutes up to the CBD to the airport to the Gold Coast, to the Sunny Coast, you know, to uh, Springfield, this, this area is just in that, in that apex. So um, it's why it's, it's been a very big earmarked area from both an employment growth corridor, but also a, um, a population growth corridor. And they've spent a lot of money here recently. And for me, when I'm looking at markets to go in, there's only a couple that I like in Southeast Queensland. I'm generally just following where people are spending money. Yeah. And when I say people, I mean like, the government or private, you know, I want, you want that ability because that just promotes more, more growth. Just looking, just looking at, look, I can't believe how much education, just that line of education that you've got there, like that's unheard of. And look, I'm always looking for it's jobs too, look at it. It's all jobs. It's all jobs. Like Ed Med, like probably now more than ever, we can see that education and medical are going to be, you know, and across the world, they are the two biggest job growth areas mm -hmm. because they're still not, they're not affected as much by technology. Yeah. You know, you still need a human element to them. So they're ones that I focus on. Mm -hmm. um, and look, with the COVID environment now, everyone, you know, like in the audience, it's, we're, we've definitely seen this, that the first people that are, you know, that we're seeing change in residential property are the ones that aren't anchored and that's your renters. Yeah. And so there is a flight to quality. So if you're thinking from an investment point, one is obviously, yes, how many owner occupiers will have an area, but two, you know, do I have that walkability? Do I have that park? Do I have that shop? You know, things like that. And that's something now in a new COVID world that if you end up with like say localized lockdowns that we've seen in obviously, you know, Sydney and definitely obviously what we're seeing in Melbourne, we want to have this proximity. So yeah. well, I, we, I can only go five kilometers from my home at the moment. So I've got to um, make sure, right. that, you know, we've got the lake, we've got the tan, we've got everything nice and close, but um, yeah. there's plenty that don't. So. so yeah, walkability is everything. Look, the street presence, everything that Marquee do, we love. They just do a very nice community, really well landscaped. They've got a, I mean, look, they've got such a stakeholder in this, which is that park, you know, so that, that, that huge five hectare park that as you come into the estate, you know, which isn't a thoroughfare, this estate is, is literally one entry in and not a cut through. So, you know, you're really, a, you're bound by this, this huge park uh, to, the, to the site. And so, you know, they'll do such a great job in landscaping it. Um, the, the average lot size in here is about 400 square metres and the frontage is about an average of 13 and, and 13.35. So 
even the smaller lot, like I'd say when I call smaller, like a 355 square meter is still a 12 and a half meter frontage. And that we like a good frontage yeah. because it just gives that street presence, you know, where you've got too many narrow houses, it's not so good. Um, but this is the park guys. So you can imagine like good place to kick a ball, uh, you know, walk the dogs, play with the kids, have a picnic. It's, it's really well matured and shaded. Um, we're not coming into a new park area. Um, this footpath here is actually illuminated at night and you have a basketball court. So to me, what a great amenity for only 64 houses. Yeah. Um, this just gives you a quick, I'm just going to go quickly through this because I'm just conscious of your time, but sure. you know, uh, and you can and you can give them all the information if they really. Yeah, just, there's um, a link down below uh, for anybody watching the yeah. to get some more information but about this. Really well landscaped, and you know, I think that to me just creates this community um, that you know, Mark here are really trying to do. And, and again, we've been able to you know create these packages for here at a price point that is, you know, in the market sub five hundred thousand, um, and you know, going to be registered going to be looking for registrations at the end of this year and construction starting early next year. So that is, um, that's the plan. I'll just quickly, so I want to quickly that's probably a question at the moment. That's going to be um, uh, good for the um, builders grant as well, no doubt. Yeah. And that's why that stage wow. one absolutely flew out the door because it's qualified for home builder. Stage two will also qualify for home builder, but, but uh, you know, we want to, we've got something there for Remington once we launch it that we wanted to look after <laughs> those guys because it seems to just fly out the door at the moment. So, That's um, different to what you guys are doing. Yeah. yeah. So look, I, this is where I was talking about this trans apex. Um, you know, this is a really good map. I just wanted to show you just how much employment this area has, but just how much infrastructure it's, it's had in the area. This is where the project is here. Mm -hmm. And you can see like, if you go north or in the city, it is, just, it is situated around this huge infrastructure pipeline that is existing. Um, it's had an, it's the Logan motorway here, which has really just been upgraded between this section at a $512 million one, you know, just been pumped into it. And the reason for that is, is that it is all about transport in this area between the Pacific, the gateway and the Logan, because this is how Southeast Queensland's travel from freight and from obviously a job and employment market. So they're pumping a lot of money into a very, very small area yeah. And if you look at where a lot of development or population growth has been earmarked, it's in this southern corridor between Springfield, southern Brisbane and northern Logan, and then into the Gold Coast. So we're seeing out of all of Queensland's projected population growth, this area has been earmarked for number one and two spot for growth. So this is a big, you know, for, for me, it's an area that we're going to focus on because it's got major job node. They've just announced a $460 million upgrade to the Logan Hospital, which is part of obviously some of the earlier COVID infrastructure projects that we're going to be seeing. And that to me is just more jobs. More so, um, look, it's, as I said, this is the walkability for the shopping centre. So full line shopping centre, event cinema, you know, Target, Kmart's, like everything you need. You know, it's a big, big complex. There are four shopping precincts here in this market and literally a 12 minute walk from my, which looks like a little Mexican guy with his son. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, this is again, all about amenity for the, for the project. Uh, and look, we're seeing a lot of wealth coming south into this market. So the neighboring suburbs, the median house prices for the neighboring suburbs are, are in excess of, you know, two, almost $200,000 more uh, of what we're offering, you know, and, and look at like Parkinson here at 675, Callanvale 655, these are the adjoining suburbs. So um, it is one that I don't think is going to last. Uh, but look, competition wise, probably the only thing I want to touch on here, Tim, quickly is it is an infill market. So you, you're not going to see the very big project here. We're probably the largest project in the, in the area now. But that's another really good point. If you're thinking about um, um, uh, you know, buying a house on land package, how many lots are actually available? And don't just look at the stage that you're in. Like, I mean, this is a true infill site. You're not going to have hundreds of other uh, lots available. Yeah, exactly. And look, the key thing that I've seen in, in this community is, is the development quality is pretty poor, um, largely because of the, the style of development that has occurred. And look, uh, it's, it's, as I mentioned before, one of the things that I look for is just, you know, is the, the dimensions of the lot. And this area is made up of a lot of square lots. So you can see the competition, you know, traditional is a rectangular, so narrow frontage, long depth. 
this is very square. And when you have square outcomes, you can see the type of housing, which is not a lot of backyard, um, a lot of face. So you're, you're, they're actually more expensive to build, but you're not actually getting the efficiency. So you get a dark house, small backyard, same sort of lot size, and you can see the difference in the efficiency. Um, and, you know, there's actually someone that, you know, still renting here or even like, you know, trying to sell because it's just not a, it's an inferior product. So this is where, again, you've got to be looking at the details of what you're getting. Um, because again, that, you know, you don't see a lot of square lots because it's not the most desirable product. Yeah. Um, but just quickly finishing, I look, this market is a truly owner occupier market. It is infill. I've gone through and analyzed just how many renters exist in this market. Um, and 85.84% of the existing residential around me, the, the single detached dwellings are actually owner occupier, very little investor here. Um, so Tim, I don't know if you want me to jump on realestate.com, I can show you the rentals right now, but this market. Um, I know last we did that, that last week and we couldn't find one. So I know there's no, no rental um, properties yeah. there on the market at the moment. Uh, I'm mindful of time because the, the, there's a couple of questions that I've okay. got for you here. So if we might fly through that and then um, obviously I'm going to supply uh, anybody wants to click on that link. We've got some brochures and nice things for anybody who's interested in that. But John, thanks so much for um, uh, all of those insights. It's fantastic. Um, we have got a couple of questions. We've got a, a question from Christian, which is for you, John. It says, um, how do you see the Brisbane market performing over the next 12 to 24 months? Okay, so yeah, look, it's, again, it's 12 to 24 months. I haven't got the, the, uh, the crystal ball in front of me, unfortunately. But I think, look, I'm going to take a very good educated approach to this and, and look at the moment. Everything revolves around, you know, lockdowns and COVID and things like that. Now, we've been very lucky in, you know, uh, to, to sort of go through what we've seen and not have a second wave yet. Um, this has obviously created this parallel universe between our two cities. But I think the key thing here is the home builder is really giving the market a shot in the arm. It's actually, we were going into COVID with a very low supply mm -hmm. of stock. So even before COVID, our market from a residential new product development was very constrained. And I think that is def with the new home builder now, we're hearing there's no stock. Like I'm trying to find new, new builds at the moment, very hard. Yeah. So I definitely see a bit of a price, definitely, definitely stabilization and potential growth in the next 12 months because supply and demand. Yeah. Now, if we see, you know, potential this inter, inter, intra and interstate migration coming in, I definitely think that there's going to be a big flavour for South East Queensland because we've got the affordability, we've got the yield. Yeah. And if we can stay COVID clean, then this probably is going to make us a very big safe haven. So that's... Well, I mean, it's, it's like Brisbane's had the handbrake on for a couple of years now, but it's, it's all the... Um all the things are pointing to, uh, towards growth over the next couple of years. It's just, uh, yeah, we I haven't had that move. It hasn't already happened to be honest. Yeah, we've had a very, very slow, we've, we've been, we've been the, the scenario where they say like you put a frog in boiling water, it jumps out. We've been the frog been put in sort of warm water and we're boiling to death. Like we've been very slow here. Yeah. Whereas Melbourne and Sydney had that frog jump out. So this is probably a good sign for us because we're affordable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the challenge is gonna be around supply, which ultimately leads to price growth. Yeah. That's it. Um, so uh, one for Tim uh, from Carol. I'm based in Sydney. Do you service clients in Sydney? Yes, of course. So a um, bit of background. Reventon is a national company. So we, you know, we service our clients on, on Zoom just like uh, we're doing today. But look, we, we offer all of our services via Zoom. So we do everything from uh, financial planning, accounting, uh, property investment. But the main thing is, you know, we just start with a discovery meeting like this. Uh, find out what your circumstances are and then uh, take it from there. So um, I'll, I'll shoot you an email as well, just a little bit more detail on that. Um, Nikita, uh, John, do you see prices dropping due to COVID? I don't know if she meant um, specifically to Brisbane, but just as I suppose generalisation for real estate. Look, it's, it's, uh, I've been very vocal and, and you know, we, when I caught up with Chris, the, you know, a couple when we were in the thick of COVID, you know, yeah. that first wave, I said that I wasn't expecting the dramatic price drop uh, I definitely said there would be correction markets and there would be markets that were probably inflated to begin with that yeah. probably would come down. And I think that's happened. Yeah. I think we're seeing that. You know, the good thing about residential property is that if you don't need to sell, we're not going to put our properties on the market. Now, if we're, if you, the, the, the employment market is, is, hasn't, it's obviously, you know, it's heading towards, a, uh, obviously it's, it's grown and, and that's something that we've got to be watching. And sorry, the unemployment side. But look, ultimately for me, 
The big dramatic drops, no, I don't think so. I think what we're going to see is definitely corrections in sub-markets where they were probably inflated to begin with, where they've probably had growth. Now they need to sustain themselves and come down. And yeah. if you're in a market that's fundamentally, yes, if it's going to have COVID and you end up with this lockdown scenario, yes, you might have some pain. Yeah. Uh, but remember, when there's pain, there's also no more supply. So you, you hit the nail on the head. I was about to say one thing that's happened, you mentioned supply and demand before. You know, I, I originally, when I thought, okay, anybody's on the market at this time, you know, you're probably picking up some bargains. But, you know, we're, what we've actually seen is because there's less um, uh, properties on the market at the moment, they're actually fetching higher prices in a lot of cases. And um, I, did not, I didn't see that coming. But there's exactly. Been- yeah, and I, I've been saying, I've been saying this, like if you were sick to begin with before COVID, you're probably going to still be sick now. Like it's... Yeah. It's like that in any industry, right? Like if your business wasn't doing well before COVID, you're probably not going to be doing any better now. So it's the same with housing. You know, like if you're going to go and look at markets that were really oversupplied previously, they're probably going to be in a bit of pain now. Because remember, like if we're relying on that international migration to come in, you know, and they're no longer there, or I'm in a market that is very, you know, fixated on say rental properties with a, um, like a, a hospitality rental market, those markets potentially going to be in pain, yes, because like those markets industries are one affected. So logical sense to me that there's going to be some changes in those sectors. Is it dramatic enough to show huge price drop? I don't think so. It will just have correction, yes. Yeah. Which is, is and that's an opportunity, right? It could be an opportunity. It is. Um, I've got another one here. Don't, I don't know who it is, but they've asked a question for Tim. Who's the best builder in Victoria? It's a good question. I'll probably put myself on the spot if I uh, give you a direct answer. But look, I think, um, and this probably comes down to a real summary of um, you know, the subject today that, you know, um, it's all about getting the right advice to begin with. So don't try and do this stuff on your own. Um, and when it comes to, to builders, I can tell you whether you build with A, B, C or D, you can end up getting a really good build or a really bad build. What the key to it is, it's going to come down to uh, getting the right su- site supervisor. Um, the way that Reventon work, we work with the wholesale builders, uh, hence uh, like working with um, John here at Urbane. Um, whilst they do have a retail arm, we always work with their, their wholesale departments. And what that means is, um, you know, something's not going wrong with the build, they're answering uh, to us rather than an end consumer. Um, and, the, you know, the truth be you known, we just have a, bit, a bigger voice than uh, most consumers because we're putting, you know, hundreds of deals through uh, um, builders each year. And I think what that does is keeps them honest. So, I really don't think I can say that there's one builder better than the other purely because but they share traits. You know, realistically, let's face it, they're, you know, they're, they've got a different brand and things like that. But ultimately, you're going to get um, the success out of having the right site supervisor, in my opinion. That's, that's the experience that I've seen. Um, Joel, I've got one more uh, from Yuri, which is for you. Um, it says, you were investing, uh, if you were investing today, would you go for Brisbane or Melbourne? So no Sydney in that one. You've only got Brisbane or Melbourne. Be careful what you, um, what you answer here. <laughs> Look, I, I'm, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit biased at the moment because of what I'm seeing in Brisbane. Um, you know, and it, it, I guess it just depends on how much money I had to invest. But look, ultimately, I'm chasing yield at the moment. Yeah. I'm very, you know, and, and let, me, uh, let me just answer this without a location, without having a bias to it. But what I'm, what I, as an investor right now, you know, for me, I'm very conscious that maybe I'm not going to have so much price growth. And I'm, I'm not, I am interested in growth, definitely. But I think ultimately I want cash flow yeah. and I want some security there on yield. I'm just not seeing the yields in Sydney and Melbourne. Mm. Um, because of the price of entry. Yeah. So for me, that's probably the way I'd be looking at it. Uh, and, you know, I think the fundamentals at the moment have changed a lot for these markets. So again, I'm, like I said, I'm biased towards Brisbane, but I think, uh, I think that's the reason, like if I had to sort of just take that hat off and just look at it just fundamentally on that, it's going to be a yield play for me. So that would look, I'm always cautious of um, answering a question like that as well without knowing the background behind the client as well. So for whoever, uh, Nikita, if you, uh, sorry, Yuri, if you wanted to um, you know, uh, tee up a time to have a chat, be more than happy to do that. But the, the reason I say that is because what's right for one person is not right for the other, whether it's Melbourne or yep. Sydney, whether it's house and land versus apartment. And, you know, the key to it um, really is to identify what are, what are your goals? What, what's in your portfolio already? Are you buying it for um, owner-occupier or investor? Are you buying it for your self-managed super fund? It, all, all of these things got to be taken into account. And I think um, you know, a generic uh, answer probably doing it an injustice. So really identifying what it is that you're trying to achieve and then developing a strategy around that. That would be my advice. 
Um, there is some more questions in there. Keep them coming, guys. Uh, we'll leave the webinar open for um, another 20 minutes or so. So get some more questions in there and uh, our team will come back to you. But John, thanks so much for your time today. We probably ran a little bit longer than um, I, I promised we, um, we would take, but it's been really good content and I think um, the viewers would have got a lot out of it. Yeah, thanks so much, Tim. I know you and I can, we can talk forever on this stuff. So <laughs> for everybody today in the audience and good questions and, and yeah, I'd love to, love to answer some more. Good on you. So there's a couple of links there for um, people wanting more information about Urbane Homes and Hillcrest. Um, and certainly if you wanted to come via us, we can um, do some PIAs for you to see what holding costs and things like that would look like. John, thanks so much. Take care, stay safe, and we'll be in touch again soon. You too. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, speak to you soon. Thanks, everybody.